I want you to know that what I'm saying to you applies at least as much to me. And I also believe that being comfortable is not our highest calling as Christians. So I'm telling you in advance that this may be uncomfortable because it is for me, but I want you to know that I'm not apologizing because I believe in what I'm saying and I believe it's something that's important for us to hear. Our scripture today is from, the sec is from 2 Corinthians, and as you know, the original letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth wasn't divided into chapters and verses. It was one long letter, and the chapters and verses were put in by scholars later on uh, for the convenience of later readers. I think the break between chapter 5 and chapter 6 is a little awkward, so I've chosen verses at the end of chapter 5 and on into the beginning of chapter 6. I'd like to focus on the idea of being ambassadors for Christ. We, as ambassadors of Christ, are charged with a ministry of reconciliation. This comes from chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Now, I want to unpack the word ambassador a bit. Ambassadors come from the world of government and politics. An ambassador is an official representative of a government. Usually, this is the highest ranking diplomat, someone who lives and works in a country that is not their home country. Ambassadors have usually spent years living in the country to which they're assigned, learning the culture and the language and how to communicate effectively. The primary duties of an ambassador are to protect the citizens of their own country, to support prosperity at home and abroad, and to work for peace. Ambassadors are not rulers. They're not kings or queens or presidents or even prime ministers. They are representatives of the rulers whom they serve. And I bet some of you have already figured out where this is going. Because Paul says it straight out. We are ambassadors for Christ. God is making an appeal through us. It's God's message that we are carrying. And here is the message, that good news, that we are to carry for God. Through us, God is working towards the healing and wholeness of the entire world. That is good news. God wants the world to be back in line, to match up with how God created it to be. Paul uses the word reconcile. Now, we shouldn't be intimidated by that word and think of it as having a whole lot of theological freight. As many of you know, some of you way better than I do, reconcile also comes from the world of accounting. It means having things correspond, getting accounts to match up. And at least in my very limited experience with accounting, reconciliation rarely just takes care of itself. It takes some effort, particularly if accounts have gone for a while unattended. Reconciliation may take significant time and effort. It's no different with relationships. Reconciliation means tending to the things which are out of alignment. It works best when we work at our relationships regularly, before things get wildly out of control, when we spend time on the relationships which are important to us, when we deal with conflict honestly and directly and as soon as we're aware of it, rather than denying it or ignoring it, or hoping that it will simply go away. Recon relationships reconcile best when both sides are invested in a positive outcome. In fact, it has to be positive 
for both sides. A relationship that is really great for me and really crummy for you, not a great relationship. Paul tells us that Christ is the way that God has chosen to reconcile the world. That God chose to, to send his sinless son to become our sin so that we could become righteous. In other words, God through Christ cleared the books for us so that our debt is zero. There's no way that we could have reconciled that account on our own. No way that we could make ourselves righteous except through the grace of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, so don't accept the, the grace of God in vain. You've been given a second chance. Don't blow it. This is the time to act. This is the day of salvation. So let's start by not making reconciliation more difficult for anyone else. This is the same formula which is given to physicians and other healers. First, do no harm. Our first charge is not to get in the way of others getting to know Jesus Christ. This is not as simple as it might sound. Hypocrisy and judgment are obstacles to our ministry. Trying to pass myself off as perfect when I know darn well I'm not perfect is much more harmful to my witness than acknowledging that I am sinful and broken just like you. Deciding that someone is not worth my time and effort because I don't agree with their lifestyle choices might be a greater loss for me than it is for them. Ignoring a guest at Creekside because you're an introvert and you really don't know what to say may feel more comfortable to you, but what message does it send to that person? Or how about if you're just too busy talking to your friends to greet somebody else? What message does that send? First, do no harm. Don't put obstacles in anyone's way. It's difficult enough for a guest to come and be outside of their comfort zone without making them feel like their presence is inconvenient for us. I want to get back to the idea of being an ambassador for Christ because that's the next step. That's the active step in this process. Ambassadors actually engage in the country where they are sent to work. Often they live and work for, from an embassy, a post that is built and maintained for their diplomatic work. This church is our embassy. We host functions here. We invite folks to be part of them. Administrative stuff happens here. But our work as ambassadors has to go on out there, out in that country, the country where we have been sent to relate to. The relationships we have with family, the friendships with our neighbors and classmates and coworkers and whomever, that is where we have been sent. That is why we are sent. As ambassadors for Christ, our primary purpose is not to fill up the embassy. It's to invite people into the kingdom of God. Just as God sent Christ so that we could be reconciled to God, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation so that other people can experience the good news of healing and wholeness. Of course, the church is a part of that ministry, but the church is not the purpose of that ministry. The purpose of our ministry is to get ourselves and our world back in line with how God intends it to be. Being an ambassador 
It is not an easy job. We have to understand both our homeland and the country to which we have been sent. The rules might not be the same. In the kingdom of God, it's the meek and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and the peacemakers who are blessed. Out there, not so much. It's the wealthy and the privileged and the aggressive who seem to be doing okay. We have to be able to relate to people from that country without giving up our identity as Christ's people. We have to be winsome enough as Christians that we don't put up obstacles in anyone's way. And we have to be enthusiastic enough to let people know that the good news of Christ is for them too. So I'm going to ask you a set of questions. I don't want you to raise your hand or to stand up and shout, uh, but I do want to take, I do hope that you will take these seriously. Some of these come from the pages of Outrageous and Courageous, the books that our small groups are studying. Not every outrageous and courageous act is for everyone, but I believe every Christian is called to be uncomfortable or to take a risk at some time in their Christian walk. So please think about how you are being challenged to be an ambassador for Christ at this time in this place. You may notice there's kind of a hierarchy of these questions. That's not accidental. Each of these starts with would you. Would you leave your family and your profession in this country to be an ambassador for Christ in another country. Would you leave your family and work in this country for a short-term assignment as an ambassador for Christ in another country? Would you Take time away from commitments at home to work on a service project to rebuild a community in the United States or in another country. Would you use your own money to go on a service project? Would you give your own money so that someone else could go on a service project? Would you give your own money for ministries at Creekside? Would you be willing to commit to an amount and communicate that so that leaders could plan? Would you volunteer to serve at, Cre at a Creekside event for our community, even if you'd do it differently if you were in charge? Would you talk to someone in a grocery line about Jesus Christ? Invite them to church. Would you step away from a committee or responsibility at Creekside so that you'd have more time to interact with people in the community outside of our church? Would you support the ministries of other folks at Creekside or at least not put obstacles in their way. Would you park in a parking space further from the front door so there would be an open space for a guest on Sunday morning? Would you give a bottle of cold water to a sweaty cross-country runner? Would you sit in a different seat in the worship center so that there would be convenient open seats for a visitor on Sunday morning? Would you excuse yourself from a conversation on Sunday morning in order to greet a guest? 
would you greet someone in the name of Christ, even if you don't know them? Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to answer yes to all of those questions in order to be an ambassador for Christ. There's not a magic number of yes answers that qualifies you as a great Christian. And there are plenty of fine questions that I could have asked that aren't on this list. But if you could not affirm any of these statements, I would like to ask you gently and respectfully, what are you doing here? I mean, it's great to come to the embassy. Here is a fine place to be, but our work as ambassadors for Christ sends us out there to serve and to heal. In Christ's name, amen.